It's awesome. It's awesome to have those kids, isn't it? It's great. It's awesome. Um, man, this morning, I hope you, uh, I, some of those songs were probably new to you. I hope you didn't turn off your mind as we were singing those songs. There were a lot of great words in there. And I was just thinking, you know, it's, it's weird that we sing about the blood and what Jesus Christ did for us. And after he leaves the 99, if you don't know what those stories are behind that, you're like, what is that talking about? That's why you need to get in the book, right? That's why you need to come and understand what the songs that we sing are because of stories that we know in the Bible, how God protected, provided, guided, and directed. And they were really powerful. They were really good. I really liked it. So before we begin, let's just pray and uh, ask God to help us understand his word. My Father, my God, I thank you for the sing time of worship, that it can just quiet our hearts, uh, we can listen to the melodies, we can listen to the words and just remember what you've done for us. Remember what you've done for others in the, in the New and the Old Testament and just know that you are the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so, Lord, thank you for that um, promise that you don't change. We don't have to guess what you're thinking. You know what you've always said and will always be true. So, Lord, as we open the word of God, may we um, read it carefully and may we um, interpret it correctly and may we apply it. May it may not just stay in our head, but may it go to our heart and then through our actions and, and telling people and being your representative here on earth. May we live the life that you want us to live here on earth. Um, Lord, open our hearts and our minds to wisdom and understanding. Help us understand more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as I was talking about, what is this book? The Bible, right? And what does the Bible talk about? What does it tell us? It tells us about God, who God is. And isn't it great that we serve a God that's the same for all eternity? He doesn't get moody. Right? He doesn't have a bad day. He doesn't get frustrated that his TV series ended. He has to wait a whole other year for the next season to come out. You know, he's consistent. He loves us, and he's always going to treat us the same way that he's said in his word. This Bible also tells us about us about the fact that we have fallen short of God's glory. There's no way that we can be equal with God. There's no way we can become more than God. We fall short. It also tells us what's acceptable behavior and what's unacceptable behavior. We learned about that last week. Why, does, why is God the only person that can really tell us, the only being that can tell us what to do, right or wrong? Because he created us. He's God. He has a right and a, a, a responsibility to tell us what he wants and what he doesn't want. Right? I mean, he created us. He has that responsibility. It also tells us about the future, what to expect. And wouldn't it be nice to know the future right now? I talk to different people, and they're, they're like so worried about wars and earthquakes and volcanoes and weather. And if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, what are we worried about? Because if we die, where, do we, where are we going? To heaven, for eternity. We're trading up. You want a new body? You're like, my, I lost my warranty at Walmart for my new body. I can't find it. It's just running out. You know that God's going to give you a new body? And there's only one requirement, is that you trust him for what he did for you by sending his son to die on the cross. Unfortunately, a lot of us, or a lot of people, don't trust that. They say, no, I can make it. I'm, I, why, do I, why do I have to obey him to receive the benefits? Can I just do what I want to do and get still this glory? If God tells us to do something, if God directs us to do something, should we do it? We should. And that's our main passage today. Open up to 2 Timothy if you have your Bibles. If not, it's going to be on the screen. That's okay. But 2 Timothy. And we're going to start in verse, or chapter 3 and verse 14. And it says this. But you must remain faithful to those things you have been taught 
You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. This is very important. Paul's talking to Timothy. Paul's near the end of his life. He's not going to be around very much longer. And he's telling Timothy, look it. You've studied the word. You know what the word says. So do it. Remain faithful to that. Because you know me. Paul's saying that. You know me. And Timothy knew Paul. It was like a second dad to him. And he knew all the good, bad, and ugly of Paul. Do you know that we're all like that? Is, are, is any of us good? No. We all need a Savior, right? That's why Jesus died. Verse 15. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus Christ. If you want to know how to be saved, you want to know how to go to heaven, you don't look at history, you look at the Bible. Because the Bible tells you that there was only one way to get to heaven. And it's on our wall out there. John 14, 6, it says what? Or 6, 14. I was dyslexia going there. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father but through me. And who's me? Jesus. Jesus. That's a declarative statement, okay? It's not possibly. It is only through Jesus. So you see these signs that say, oh, we can just all get to heaven. All roads lead to God. False. Because then you don't believe what Jesus said. Because Jesus said it's only through me. Now, you have a choice there. You can believe that or you can reject it. That's the cool thing about God. God doesn't force you to believe it. He says, this is the facts. You have the choice. Verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So you think it's important to get in this book? It tells us over and over, this is the principles that you must follow. Aren't you glad that God didn't put like a whole list of do's and don'ts? He said, this is the principle, now apply it in your life. That's true. Apply it in your life. This Bible tells you and guides you what is going on in life. Remember, I, last week we talked about social media. Is social media in this book? No, because it wasn't around. But are the principles to govern social media in here? You betcha it is. And then verse 17. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. This is the difference from having it up here to having it down here. I've got to tell you guys something. We have a bustling crowd of nursery kids and a bustling crowd of junior high kids or little kids that need to be taught in, in, in children's church. Do you know that we've had two women in the nursery consistently for over two months? They haven't been able to come out here and sit and listen to the message because they're constantly serving back there. And I got a secret for you. They want to come out here and listen. But they can't because nobody's volunteered to go back there. <laughs> but see, there is a point. We have ministry opportunity. God tells us principles. If you have a gifting, if you have an ability, you should help out in the church. I'm not trying to guilt you. I'm trying to tell you what's the real thing that's going on here. That's an opportunity to serve. And why do we study God's word? So we can serve others and we can serve each other. Is that not exciting? Should that not motivate you? you know, when I heard that, I almost stood up and went back and I said, well, who's going to preach? I don't know. Gary. Gary, yeah, there you go. But we need to help, right? Serve one another. That's the difference from having it up here to having it down here and serving applying it in our lives. God wants us to know what to do. Do you believe that? Does God desire you to know what is good and what is bad? Or is he just up there, oh, I, good luck. You know, there's people that believe that, that God wound up the clock and then stepped away. Good luck, you guys. I hope you make it through. That'd be terrible, wouldn't it? 
Thankfully, I believe the God of the Bible is involved because that's why he sent his son. But there's a huge problem or opportunity that we have about this. You know what that is? We don't like what God says. I don't want to do that. What are you talking about? This is hard. Do you know that the Old Testament is full of examples of hard living? I'm just going to tell you a, full, a couple of them. And you know the first one I'm going to start out with, because that's my favorite guy. What is it? Job. Job, because think about He lost everything in a span of six seconds, almost like. It seemed like. I mean, before one guy got done speaking, the next one was there. He lost his family. He lost all his wealth, all his possessions, influence. Bam. And he said, he stood up. <laughs> and he said, naked I came into this world, naked I return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And when I think about that, I look at us, I look at myself, would I say that? Would I say that? Blessed be the name of the Lord that my children are dead. Blessed be the name of the Lord that I'm on the street. Would you say that? Was that easy living? Oh, we got a second good guy here. Second guy began with the same letter. Joseph. Joseph. Here's a guy that was the favored son of this big family. And Abraham really treated, I mean, Jacob really treated uh, Joseph special, which was not right. But he did over the other brothers. The other brothers hated him. They were going to kill him. <coughs> but thankfully, one of his brothers said, no, let's not kill him. Let's make a little profit and sell him. So they sold him to Egypt. He went to Egypt. And guess what? Did he like, oh, I hate this. No, he served God in Egypt as a slave. Not only that, God blessed him and served him. And you know how he got rewarded? He got thrown in jail. Because the mistress, the, the woman of the household said, because Joseph wouldn't sleep with her, the mistress said, he tried to rape me. So how's that serving God? Yeah, I'm so glad I followed God. I'm in jail for rape. And then he's in jail, and what does he do in jail? He serves God in jail. He does inside ministry, prison ministry. He's in there serving, and he, he, he's been given the gift of interpretation of dreams. He interprets these two guys' dreams that came out of the court of Pharaoh and said, don't forget about me when you go back. How did that work? Two or three years later, I can't remember. Two or three years later, oh, yeah, there's this guy. You think Joseph had a hard time? But in the end, what happened? He became second in command of all of Egypt. Well, here's one for you. How about Jesus? Did Jesus have an easy life here on earth? The Son of God who lived in eternity with everything all communi satisfied, communion with God, just perfect. He comes down here, and he's treated as a king. He was abused, yelled at. Religious leaders said, you can't be God. And not only that, when he's about to go to the cross, the night before the cross, he goes before God the Father, and he says, God, I don't want to do this. Please take this cup from me. But then what does he say? Not my will, your will. How many of us would do that? Not my will. I got a, I got a, I got a statement for you guys. He's doing it right now. God's saying, you going to obey me or are you going to do it your way? That's us. Is this life easy? Has anybody since they've been saved said, this is a cakewalk? People are laughing. <laughs> right? Because it's hard, right? Life is hard, but is God still in control? You know, I think just even in this, in this, in this congregation, there's people that five years ago, their lives were being destroyed. 
by sin and not following God and not putting him first. And now, five years later, some of them are remarried. Some of them have a new marriage because they renewed their marriage. Some of them have gotten out of addiction. Is God in control? Sometimes we have to go through the bad to get to the good. I mean, if you have your Bible, Psalms 46. Psalms 46. And it says this. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. Do you, do you believe that? Oh, come on. Do you believe, is, it, is, it, is it here or is it right here? Yeah, that's true, but it's not for me. Verse 2, so we will not fear when earthquakes come and mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and form. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge into loot. Look at that. Do you see the destruction that's going on around in verses 2 and 3? Is that something you can control? Earthquakes, the storm surge. Teresa and I lived in Puerto Rico for 17 years, and we had hurricanes that had gone through a few times. And standing in front of the ocean, seeing the power of the waves, guess how tall I felt? I was like, I cannot stand against those things. God made them. God created them. And even in that turmoil, you can say, God is in control. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If that's true, is God going to help you today? Is God going to provide for you today? Here's the thing. He'll provide for you, but not the way you think it should be. Why didn't I get the winning lotto ticket, God? That's provision. That shows me you love me. Really? How about, does, is God going to protect you? Is God going to direct you? Bottom line is God promises to be with you. God doesn't promise to keep you from suffering, pain, situations, and challenges. How many of you are going through suffering, pain, situations, and challenges today? The rest of you, don't worry. We're, don't worry. God's forgiven your sin of lying. It's okay. All right? We have all go through struggles, do we not? We all go through suffering. We go through things we don't like. God, what is happening here? Are you still in control? Is God still in control? Yeah. Always. He's there. God doesn't promise to keep you from these things. God promises to go through it with you. Now, I got a question for you. And think about this before you answer. Is that a comfort to you, or do you feel cheated? Comfort. I hope it's a comfort. Because a lot of people say, I feel cheated. I put my whole life and gave my whole life to you, God, and I'm suffering going through this. Why me? <laughs> right. There's a thing, though. People say they, they're, they're so consumed in self. Look, I gave everything for you. Did God give everything for you? More than we could ever give. He gave his son. The significance of that is the son. We believe that God is three in one. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But one God. We don't understand it. I don't understand it. Okay. I, I can't explain it to you. And I'm okay with that, because if I could explain everything about God, God would cease to be God. So I don't understand it, but I can tell you for sure that these three were from eternity past to eternity future. There's no beginning, no ending. I can't explain that either. My mind can't wrap, wrap itself around with no beginning, because I'm a finite person. There is a beginning and an end in my life. But God is eternal. God had communion with his son and the Holy Spirit. They did not lack anything. God did not create us because he lacked love. God is love. Because of the unity of the Holy Spirit and the son 
and the Father together, they had perfect love and unity and communion for eternity. They were self-sufficient. They needed nothing else. But that, that great communion, they wanted to share with us. They created us because God wanted us to know that perfect union that he has known for all eternity. And we had it at the beginning. Adam and Eve and God used to walk in the garden talking together. Wouldn't that be awesome? And then Adam and Eve were duped by Satan. Adam believed his wife, didn't believe God, didn't trust God to find himself in God. He said, I can find a different way to be like God. And so that's why he ate the fruit. I can be like God on my own, not through God. And that became the separation. And that was such a profound sin, a profound separation, that it would take the blood of God's Son to heal it. Think about that. So the God of the universe gave up the perfect unity with his Son to send him here, and for one moment in time, they were separated. That's significant. And you say, well, they were never separated. Then why did Jesus yell out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For a moment. But think about that. They were in eternity, unity, together. What do you think one moment would feel like? Forever. Jesus died for us, and we can have salvation because of what he did, not what we do. Did you hear that? That's significant. We have salvation because of him, not because of us. So I sit here, and so why we question God about his motives when we suffer, but God suffered by sending his son. But yet we still question God. This is so hard. This is, I don't get it. You know, it's okay to complain to God. It's okay to express anger to God. But after we're done expressing, God, I don't understand this. Why is this? Nevertheless, you are God. You are sovereign. I will trust in you. That's being honest before God. I'm having a hard time. I'm struggling with this temptation. I'm struggling with this sin. I'm struggling with this addiction. But nonetheless, God, you're in control. I'll trust you no matter what. Matthew 6. Over here in Matthew 6. Matthew 6, and starting in verse 31, it says this. So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's troubles is enough for today. Go back one. I love, I love that talking, the way that is, that phraseology. God is commanding us to live today for him. Not tomorrow, not the next day. That's going to have enough problems. Today, focus on him. Today, worries come up, struggles come up. What do you do? Focus on him. It's all about God. We keep on focusing on tomorrow and t possibilities of problems tomorrow. Isn't that right? I know somebody in my household that's that way. She knows. My mom has struggled with something like that. She worries about her kids, worries about things that are going on, worries about, and you know what she keeps doing? Going back to God. It's a struggle because that's her makeup. That's her bent. She wants to control everything so it doesn't happen. You don't experience that hurt. But who can only do that? God. So yeah, she has to keep going back to God and saying, God, I'm worried about this, but I live it in your hands. God wants us to trust him completely today and trust him for tomorrow. 
God, I don't know how tomorrow is going to happen, but I'm going to trust you that you're going to work it out. Matthew 6, 27, just a, a verse back, and it says this. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? You know, people would be living for years and hundreds of years if worry helped them gain life. It'll take it away. Take it away. It goes the other way. You start worrying and it goes the other way. Next slide. We know the answer to this question. We are not in control. God is in control. We know it here, but do we know it here? Do we practice it? Do we do this? Do we trust God 100%? Are we training to trust God 100%? Training, do you hear that? I love training rather than trying. Trying makes you feel like there's a failure. Oh, I can't do it anyway, but I'll try my best, and oh, I failed, but it's expected. Training is what? You train, and there's defeats, there's victories, there's defeats, and, and you keep going, and you get better and better. Athletes are very good at this because they know that if they don't have some defeats in their lives and their training, they won't get better. When Logan, he's doing jujitsu, I tell him, hey, every match should be a great match. Like you're fighting the best guy on the thing. And if you lose, learn from it. Learn from it. And I'll never forget when he first started out, um, he would always put his arm up. And these two guys would jump up and get him in a submission move right away. And he's like, oh, because he's better than that. And you know what he learned? Not to put his arm up. <laughs> but it took defeats for him to learn, learn that. Are we training? Are we saying, God, help me to be better? Help me to, help me to beat this addiction. Help me to love my wife, love my husband. Help me to focus on you. Help me not to bring up the past. Help me to forgive. Help me to move forward. I'm training to do this. And I just read in my devotional just today, when you look back, are, have you advanced? Have you gone forward? Have you moved steps forward? Ha is your training progression progressing? Or is it stagnant? If you really want to know, ask the person... That's in your life. Am I better than I was? Have I moved? Has, has there been progress? What do I have to do better in my life? What do I have to train more in my life? What do I need to seek God more in my life? So here we are. Tr daily training for daily living. First one, read your Bible. How often? Right there, get in the book. We just established this book can tell us what's expected, what's not expected, who God is, who we are, and tells us about the future. We have daily reading plans in the back. It'll take you five minutes to read it. And I guarantee you, if you're faithful in reading, it's going to affect you. You're going to advance in your training. And not just reading, not just marking off a section, oh, I read one. It's meditating on it, reading through it and saying, what did that passage say to me? Is there anything applicable to me? <coughs> Is there something significant that I need to learn or train from this? Joshua 1.8, you have your Bible, you can turn it, but up on the screen. Study this book of instructions continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Why do we need to meditate on the word of God? It's because then we know what God wants of us and we're content. We're content with other bumps come in the road. We're able to say, blessed be the name of the Lord when disaster strikes. Because we're meditating on God's word. Psalms 119.11. This one that Taylor quoted this morning. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's why we memorize. That's why we memorize God's word. Well, John, we're memorizing the days of creation year. Why is that so important? Because so many people don't believe in the creation. So many people believe we're an accident. You are not an accident. You are valuable. God made you. You have a choice. You can believe that or not. 
I personally would rather choose that I was created and loved than just an accident. Because what hope is that? Number two, pray. How often? A set time to pray is good, right? Um, when, we're, when we're at a family dinner, when we're sitting down, thanking God for the food. That's a set time of prayer. That's good to establish that. Why? Because we get our kids thinking, we should thank God for the food. We should thank God that we had a good day, at, good day and that he wants us to have a good night's sleep. But we want to do this praying continually is better. Training to pray continually is better. When somebody cuts you off in the street, you don't say bad words. You start praying, Lord, help that person not to be in an accident. Lord, help that person get to where he needs to be. Lord, if they're going to the hospital, Lord, help them get there. Romans 12, 12, look at this. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Devote yourself to prayer. Are we a praying church? I got to tell you, that's one of our strengths is that we pray for one another. I told this illustration before, but I love it. There was somebody that was having a problem, um, a, an emotional problem. These things were going hard on him, in his, and he was, having, he, was, he was breaking down in the bathroom. And one of our people in this church saw that, and he came around, let's pray right here and now. Oh, you prayed in the bathroom? Yes, they prayed in the bathroom. God doesn't care where you pray. God just wants you to know that you're trusting him, not yourself. Number three, interact with other Christ followers a lot. A lot. Not just one day a week here in this building. Sunday church gatherings are a time of collective worship of God. We come here and what do we do? We, get, we worship God. We refocus our lives. Because do we have busy weeks? Do we have crazy weeks? Do we have weeks like we're like, what, what happened? It's Sunday already. And so we come here and we refocus. Okay, wait a minute. All these things are happening, but the focus should be on God. And this gives us a, re, re, a time to refocus our lives and say, okay, this week's going to be better because I'm going to train to pray continually. I'm going to pray to be in the Word, to be in the Word daily. And not only that, I'm going to get together with another guy or girl in the church and just talk with them and share life together. Because Sunday morning is about collective worship. Throughout the week, it's about worship with other people, but sharing life together. God commands it. You know that. That's the body of Christ. Because your gift is different than my gift. I, I'm, I'm thankful for my wife because she sees life differently than me. Thank the Lord. Because our, the life would be terrible if everybody had my focus. You know why that is? It's, it, it's very, multi, or very focused, singular focused. I'm not, uh, you know, my, my, my thing is let's, let's just get this one thing done and that's it. And that's how I focus. My wife is like, wait a minute. What about having relationship? What about doing this? What about getting out and doing? Praise the Lord, my, my God gave me my wife. Look at this, Hebrews 10, 24, it says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. In Romans 15, 2, we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. How can you help another person if you don't know what's happening in their life? How can you receive help unless you state you need help? Well, John, I tried that once and no one responded. You got to keep on reminding people because if you're like me, especially on Sunday, it comes in one ear and I got so many things right, it doesn't happen. But if I'm told later, again, guess what? It starts to take root. Well, John, I said it once, that should be enough. Wrong. You need to say it more. And if people don't respond, you need to stand on a chair and say, I need help. 
And then number four, apply all three of these things, these last three things, to our lives in remembering that God is always the same. Remember that God is always there for you. There are plenty of examples in the Bible where people are going forward, they're in communion with Christ, they're in communion with others, but they forget that God is still in control. We become busy with things. We become distracted with things and we forget that God is there. There's one example that I just love. And it's an example that you might not have thought of that I would apply to this, but it is Matthew 8, 23. Matthew 8, 23. This is a normal day in the lives of the disciples, okay? <laughs> Jesus is performing miracles, doing things, and then Jesus got into the boat and started, uh, Jesus, then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly, a furious storm struck the lake. The waves breaking into the boat. Don't go, they'll stay right here. What's that last line? How many of you can get on a boat and a storm's happening and you can sleep? So I got a question for you. How, did Jesus get tired in ministry? He got exhausted in doing God's will, will for his life. He got so exhausted that a storm came, water splashing on his face, and he's asleep. I would not have slept. I would have had to have been very tired. But he's asleep. And this is like any other day. The disciples get in the boat with Jesus, go across the lake to go do ministry in another part. And what happens? A storm comes. And you think the disciples are like, this is great. This is awesome. We have the God of the universe at the front of the boat. We're safe and sound. Is that how the disciples reacted? Okay, good. Yeah. Next verse, 25. The disciples went and woke him up shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Are they in panic? Oh, yeah. Are they in fear? Oh, yeah. Jesus responded, why are you afraid? Have you so little faith? I just want to stop right there. If you're going to God and you're just saying, I can't stand my life, I don't want to. It was Jesus asking, why are you so afraid? Do you have such little faith in me? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. Now, before we go on, what would you, how was your reaction if a guy stood up and said, peace be still, and everything's... Yeah, you would be freaking out a little bit. What does this guy have to say? What's, he hap what's happening? And that's exactly what the disciples did in 27. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the winds and the waves obey his name. Remember the song we sang? Even the winds and the waves obey his name. That's the God we serve. Do you guys believe God can do miracles in your life? He does. Even sometimes you can't see them. You know, I think about people that, you know, they, they get delayed for whatever reason. They get delayed. I don't know what's happening. They're going on a trip, and, uh, you know, the family's taking a long time. They're in Puerto Rican time. Yes. And, you know, they're, they're not leaving on time. And then finally they leave on time, and then you learn about a huge accident that happened if that you would have been involved in or near if you would have left on time. Was God protecting you? Do you give glory to God? You go, finally, we're on our way. Let's go. Ugh. God, I can't believe my family is still on Puerto Rican time. Jesus Christ is our cornerstone. Jesus Christ is our rock. Jesus Christ is the one you should be following. Why do we doubt? Why do we just practice things up here, but we don't? We don't train in here to follow him. Are we all in for Jesus? Are those just words? Is that just something we say up here? Or do we truly believe it? Do we truly want to serve? Do we truly want to be God's ambassadors here on earth? We're not to escape this life. We're to shine in this life. 
Think about that. We are Jesus' representatives in this life. And this is important. We are not Jesus. Do you hear me? We're not Jesus. We need Jesus in our life. We need him to save us. We need him to train us. We need him to do anything in this life. And we got to get that in our minds. We need you, God. We need your help. I need your help. And when we realize that we're not all that, that Jesus is all that, we can start encouraging one another. Because if that person fails, we can sympathize. We may not fail the same way, but we have failed. And we can say, you know what? God has brought me through it. I go back to my favorite guy, Job. You think after God restored him, he sat there and said, oh yeah, I deserved it. Yeah. Or did he encourage other people? God brought me through this, and God restored me. Glory to God. You know how I know that to be true? Because his four friends that came along, and after seven days blew it because they opened their mouths, um, who prayed for them when God confronted them? Job. Job prayed for his friends, and God kept from punishing them receiving their just rewards for what they were doing. God gave them grace and mercy because of Job had compassion and sympathy for his friends and prayed for his friends. Can we not do that for one another? Can we not serve one another? Can we not, when we hear somebody that's in need, that would like to do something or like to get out and be able to be involved in here, can we not serve them and serve God by helping out somewhere in the church? Can we not be, okay, God, use me in whatever way? Can we do that? God's sitting there saying, let me work through you. Be a light, be a representative of me. Let's pray. My Father, my God, I thank you for this lesson. I thank you how it impacts my life. And I pray that we would move this knowledge, move this understanding from our heads to our hearts. And not just keep it in our hearts, may our actions flow through the training of our heart. As we train, may our actions just reflect that in everyday life. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to serve here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. And Lord, may we take to heart what you've told us this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I'm going to have Steve come forward, and he's going to do the pray and prayer time now. Yeah, remember? I asked you, didn't I? You're good? <laughs> You're good.